Hello, everyone, and welcome to this community meetup. It is Friday again, and I'm so excited that you're with us today. Hey, the topic couldn't be more topical. It's due diligence in its largest form, in its greatest form. There are so many due diligence requirements, and you can hear the word due diligence left, right, and center. It is in this policy. This week, it came up in customs policy as well. I expect you to carry out due diligence. But what does due diligence actually mean and how should companies prepare for due diligence uh, compliance programs and what do you do if you have limited resources and all of that and more we're going to discuss right now in um in this section of of our community meetup so welcome to the community meetup let's go okay so i've just moved up here to the to the right corner hello um and i hope you're very well um, this is the presentation that I have now prepared for you, and I'll make myself a little bit bigger so that you can see me better. Um, but of course, you can always look and review any of what I say in the slide deck as well. So it is about due diligence and why it matters to customs, export controls, and sanctions professionals. So if you want to learn about that, this is the right video for you to watch if you're watching on demand. And thank you for those that are joining live. This is part of our community meetup. Our community meetups are opportunities for customs, export control sanctions, import and export professionals, and really anyone interested in customs, export controls, and global trade to get together in a virtual event and discuss matters of joint interest. When we meet, there's usually a theme or a topic that, that you have suggested, um, and that will help us to continuously build the subject matter expertise that we as professionals in the field need, but in a in a good way, in a way where we can eat lunch, where we can relax, where we, you know, where we're not needed to be um, explaining ourselves. We can just digest this information and then join a informal uh, discussion afterwards. In this way, we continuously build our subject matter expertise and grow our network with like-minded people. And today, we welcome people from all over the world including the UK, including the EU, including India, um, Australia, the US, we're all here. So thank you very much for making the effort of dialing in and using modern technology to connect. So you can join too, if you're watching this on demand, and it happens every Friday, well, most Fridays, um, at 12 UK time, which is a little bit early for the US, I get that, um, but in, it's a little bit late for the, uh, for the Asian countries, but you know what? That's what it is. So please join us, um, just register. And then today I have a wide range of documents for you that is in your chat right now. So if you're interested in due diligence and you wanna know the, wanna have access to the documents that I'm referring to, you can download them right now. So there are an unprecedented seven things that I'm sharing today. So you will get in your chat right now, the European Commission guidance for EU operators implementing enhanced due diligence to shield against Russian sanction circumvention. So we're gonna talk about what that entails, um, but the information is available right now in your chat box. This slide deck, obviously, um, where you have all the live links, you can just click on them and read away. Then also we have the the um, US Export Controls for Military and Defense Items Program Guidelines. And that's really useful because it contains a lot of good stuff for criminal compliance perspective. The DDTC ITA Risk Matrix, and then three articles which are really gonna be useful for you to, enhance, to think about and maybe change, adopt, um, monitor, your due diligence for your, the companies you're working for. And we have once the due diligence for trade compliance best practice uh, article, the due diligence for SMEs low cost strategies, and then the summary of an EU study on due diligence for SMEs. So you will have access to all of these documents right now. And if you're watching this on demand, then please join us live next week so you can also get all of these documents. So let us talk about AML first. The anti-money laundering situation in the European Union are the examples that I've picked to show you where due diligence and how due diligence matters. So if you follow the um, policy development of many nations, but in this case, the European Union, you know that there is a political consensus on the regulation establishing a unified anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism finance network and this will then be the sixth directive of the AML, 
the anti-monetary uh, mo um, anti-money laundering law of the European Union. We also will have an EU-wide authority for AML situated in Frankfurt, and that means the fight against anti-money laundering or money laundering, I should say, um, uh, is going to be is going to be more important. It's going to be picked up, and there will be very much higher emphasis on preventing money laundering and also financing a terrorism network. This means that companies, wherever they're located, because similar rules apply in the UK, as they do in the US, as they do in India, as they do everywhere else. Well, not everywhere else, but, you know, to a significant amount across the world. Um, these efforts will be stepped up and therefore there is a renewed call for due diligence in companies just looking at the anti-money laundering situation. Today in the EU, we are um, impacted by the regulation of 2015, so quite, quite old already, therefore we are updating it. But still today, we're using this regulation, 8, 4, and 9, and this talks about the prevention of the use of financial systems for the purpose of money laundering on terrorist financing. And it is that that we will have a look at first. There will be in total three examples of why due diligence matters. So here we go. Directive 2015-849 addresses due diligence requirements concerning anti-money laundering and, count and countering the finance financing of terrorism. So we have AML and a CFT. And this stipulates that financial institutions, so that's not necessarily the importer exporter, but of course, in order to get paid, you do need to have a strong banking system on your side. So it is this banking system um, that finance system and professionals working with money that must conduct customer due diligence and um, have the measures in place to counteract money laundering, laundering and financing of terrorism. And that includes identifying customers' identities and assessing potential risk of money laundering and terrorist financing. So the kind of basic things that you need to do for any international transaction uh, therefore, is to collect relevant information about your customers, your business or their business activities, the beneficial owners, and that can be really, really difficult to establish, but it's necessary, and to monitor transactions for suspicious activities. So if we look at this regulation a little bit closer, and don't worry, I won't go into all the details of it. I know it's lunchtime and we want, and it's Friday, so we want to chill out. I know that. Don't worry. Um, but if you were to just kind of browse over the, the articles of this 2015 law already, you can see that really the basic starting point is due diligence for the customer. And here uh, we need to look at account and relationship purpose, customer assets and transaction size and regularity and duration of that relationship. So taking these three into consideration will give you a basic structure of what due diligence really for every international transaction should be like. And this applies to obligated entities. And these include the banks, but also lawyers, accountants and other professionals involved in financial transactions. So this is basic customer due diligence. And while I am explaining that, ask yourself, how is that impacting your company? How can you support your banks in delivering that information? Would you be able to tell them what is the relationship between you and your customer? Who are these customers? What is their size? All of this information they need from you and you need it from your customer. If you then go further, the first time you will see the word enhanced due diligence in the context of the AML. And here, uh, this customer due diligence, still focused on the customer, it applies at higher risk cases, identified by what's known as the member states or obligated entities. And it includes examination of more details. Um, principally here, we are talking about complex, large, unusual transactions or those lacking economic purpose. So where this happens, the banks have to recognize it and they have to um, they, they have to ask you about that to hold the shipment until they're certain that this um, is OK. So if you've ever transferred a large amount of money from one place to another, then there is an enhanced due diligence process that banks have to undergo through. And therefore, it might be that your transaction is not arriving at the other end for a while due to this. 
And so I've had instances where the bank called me and said, hey, is this legit? Is What, what is this about? And so this is what you then, what you then see, aha, anti-money laundering in action or measures in action. When it comes to enhanced due diligence, so this is really for complex, large, unusual transactions, then the next step is to assess, a, to have a risk management or a risk assessment, I should say, a risk assessment. And there are factors that you need to consider in Annex 3 of that regulation. So when it's suspicious, when it's large, when it's weird, then make a risk assessment and consider the details of Annex 3. And then also do consider where the money comes from. And if it's a high risk third country, then there are additional requirements that are required. So all of this, you could say, is done by the bank, by the finance institution. But of course, without you and the information you provide, well, the bank can't make an assessment. And if the bank can't make an assessment, they have to reject. So this is, it goes on then, if you're doing enhanced due diligence, there is more you need to consider, to consider and that introduces you to correspondent relationships, politically exposed persons, uh, shell banks, and, and the likes of it. So this is something you then need to think about when it comes to um, you know, dealing with celebrities or politicians or people that are in the public domain. And if that is happening, again, there are more due diligence measures um, that you need to understand, or, or very important CEOs, etc., because they are politically exposed. Um, and this also introduces the first time the shell banks. And the shell banks we'll see again in the context of sanctions in a moment. But shell banks are, you know, need to be identified and transactions with shell banks avoided. Now, that's not something that, that you can do because you're not a bank, but they will then investigate whether a bank is okay or not. And that depends on their own criteria. So if you are asked to transfer money to a bank that you've never heard of, chances are um, that that needs to be investigated whether it can, can actually be carried out. And if you're then using the banking system, then that will expose you to, to more controls and that will hold up the payment and that will require you to go back to the um, the, the, the party you're interacting with and, and asking for verification, proof, um, them to contact their bank and get letters and, and whatnot. So in order to prove that this is a legitimate bank, not a shell bank. Um, so all of this can hold up the process quite a lot. Therefore, don't let it get to that point. Be proactive about it, I guess. Um, when you do look at due diligence, uh, you will also see that there are quite a few things that need to be considered when you do carry out this enhanced consideration. These are, if you summarize it all, three. There are customer risk factors, there are product services and transaction and delivery channel risk factors, and there are geography risk factors. As you know here, there is a Annex 3, and that Annex 3 talks specifically about when there is a higher risk of a transaction, you need to carry out a more enhanced due diligence. So these are the factors that could determine whether something is of higher risk or lower risk. So higher risk means enhanced due diligence, and that means more work. And lower risk means traditional due diligence, still due diligence, but not at this heightened level. So therefore, uh, it is important that you first of all determine what could be the potential risk level and then have process and procedures in place to either deal with lower risk or higher risk transactions in your import export company because the bank will need to carry out these checks as well. So you won't get paid unless you have a system in place that satisfies the requirements of the bank, which you can find here. That's the kind of thing that they're looking for. So that's due diligence regarding anti-money laundering. And you can see there's a lot about the customer and who is this person you're identify, uh, uh, you're working with. Know your customer is the key buzzword here. And you can also see how this impacts you because it won't help you to get an export license. It won't help you to be able to send goods to a country if the bank won't pay. So without considering 
anti-money laundering requirements of your financial institution, there is no successful import or export business. The second example I want to give you of why due diligence is needed comes from the world of sanctions. Now, anyone who lived behind a rock for the last two years will maybe not know this, but if you didn't live under a rock, then you know that there are extended sanctions in place of many countries against Russia and also Belarus. And the European Union has imposed these sanctions as well and has issued extensive guidance. And that's supposed to help companies to, and there you have it again, implement enhanced due diligence efforts to shield against Russian sanctions circumvention. That document is also in your inbox. So what are, what are the reasons for this, that we now need to do this in sanctions? So we've already talked about anti-money laundering, now sanctions. Well. You can, you can see it here. There are a lot of techniques that are being explored and executed to try to get goods um, from the European Union to come to uh, the sanctioned countries, rerouting via third countries. And those third countries, certain third countries, they facilitate or they don't prevent uh, the transition from one uh, from the European Union to uh, the sanctioned countries via their country on the premises that it is an import into their country. And then they would route it onwards. There is there are complex financial um, structures in place and falsifications and uh, practices that um, make circumvention possible. And is the EU now to trying to prevent that? And one of the tools that they have in place is enhanced due diligence. So if the EU, as well as the UK, as well as the US requires this, well, what is it? What are we supposed to do? So there's a need for enhanced due diligence. And in the sanctions world and in the Russian sanctions world, they focus on high risk sectors and complex supply chain. There's guidance. That guidance is in your inbox. You can, well, in your, in your chat, you can download it. And it focuses now predominantly on the financing the flows of exported products and actually the export of these products. So how do we establish compliance in the sanctions world? Well, we do a risk assessment first, then we do ongoing due diligence, and then we look at red flags. Obviously, there's much more to say about due diligence. However, we have only limited amounts of time, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at ways that you can establish compliance if you're dealing with uh, countries that you know have potential to circumvent goods to other sanctioned or to sanctioned countries. So the three steps that I recommend that you explore are these risk assessment, ongoing due diligence and red flags. So let's go through these. First, risk assessment of possible sanctions and circumvention efforts that, that are subject to circumvention. So the first thing you do is a risk assessment and understanding. So you must assess, identify, and understand the risks that are possible in your scenario. Now, I can't say what they are because that's specific to your sector. Whether you're in aerospace and defense is different from whether you're in chemicals or you're in retail. Reoccurring risk assessment based on the evolving circumstances are then crucial. So these risk assessments need to be redone again and again. Um, and you know, we'll advise you when, when that is the case. Operators indicating uh, or initiating transactions are better positioned uh, for risk assessment and due diligence. Then we will do a strategic risk assessment step by step. <clears throat> so first we identify what could be the risk. Then we look at threat and vulnerabilities, and then we map out the at-risk products and activities. And then we assess the nature of the sector specific risks and understand their uh, potential impacts. And then we design and implement mitigating measures. Um, and then we might involve the authorities with that. And once we've done that, we have the first skeleton of a of, of a due diligence program. That then needs continuous improvement and resource allocation. So we need to make sure we're continuously adapting and enhancing this program. We identify weaknesses as we go along, and then we plug these 
gaps that might still be remaining or might reoccur or another gap that might open that we haven't thought for. As we tighten our efforts, others will try to find new routes. So this is a live and living thing and needs to be considered. Once we have this program in place, once we or once we have the skeleton of it in place, once we did the risk assessment, we know where our risk is. The next thing is then is to design the program. Once we have the skeleton, let's now design the program. And that program should not just include normal due diligence, but because of the heightened risk of sanction evasion, um, enhanced due diligence. And what is that? Based on the assessed circumvention risk, you now tailor your um, due diligence efforts. And then you look at appropriate measures, especially enhanced measures when it comes to high risk sectors and critical activities. And then compliance must be, um, must consider things like business models, geographical um, areas, and, and the risk assessment that we carried out. Generally, we will then apply best practices. So we will then look at a business partner reliability, sanctions compliance, we're going to scrutinize the transaction detail and the country routes and the financial schemes that are being used and the document consistency in order to find out where we need to tweak things in order to make sure that we're not getting into the habit or the risk of sanction evasions. And then um, we're going to have a list a list that we can then compare to the actual sanction list of clients, of goods, of divergent risk, and to also address the matter of export controls. And then we have specific clauses and contracts that might need reviewing. That's also part of the enhanced due diligence. We will then again look at banking and finance. So that's how do we make sure that the correspondent accounts uh, are not being used to reroute money uh, indirectly to sanctioned countries. And, well, there's also another risk assessment with the people that we are actually engaging with. So that's more of a bank issue, but we in, in, in business and import-export have a role to play. And you see that even when we talk about sanctions, finances and banking and risk assessment of respondents' profile comes up. So AML different reason why we do due diligence than sanctions, but solutions very similar, something that we can leverage to join sanctions and AML um, due diligence. Um, and then one of the things that I thought was really helpful in when, when I design um, compliance programs, when I design uh, quality programs to ISO standards, for example, or when I ordered them, when I carry out gap analysis um, on, on your compliance, um, when, we, when we check, often I'm asked, well, what shall we ask the customers? What shall we look for in products? What should we look for in pros and procedures? And here is um, my list, my list of queries or a list, um, the ones that I'm, you know, that I'm using. And I wanna share this with you because it's important for everyone. So at stakeholders, I separate that in stakeholder level goods and then in another. So stakeholders is the people that we deal with, the importer, the exporter, the banks, the, the, the freight forwarder, et cetera. And here are some of the questions that you can ask uh, and build into your own due diligence compliance program, um, if you so wish. Um, I, I believe that should have in every, for every of your business relationship, you should have a document that answers these questions and then gives them a ranking or gives them some kind of assessment that says, well, this is red, yellow, or green, or points one to 10, and 10 is super compliant, and zero is you know, something where we have to stop relationships right away. And these kind of questions can help you with that. Then up next, we have um, questions regarding transactional and logistical aspects and the flow of goods. Um, and here we talk about what's the country of origin, um, what's the transit destination countries, are there unconventional transporting routes? All of these questions, again, there can be an answer to it and they can be rated there. And then finally, we have the goods themselves. And here again, you need to understand, especially whether we're dealing with common high priority items or economically critical goods. 
that are going to the sanctioned countries. And if these products are in your scope, then you definitely need a enhanced due diligence system that you can quantify, qualify, and that you can make available and explain to the authorities at, at any time. Here are some of the questions that you might want to consider um, specifically to help you with this aspect. And then the third element um, on the really the, the, the final element that I can cover in the short time that I have here are the red flags. And the red flags, they deserve special attention because they can give you a lot of indication if something goes wrong as well. And really a compliance system without red flags are um, problematic. And there are many, uh, but here are the top three that I wanted to share with you. And you can uh, look at that again after the presentation and uh, download the slides and then and then see how you are addressing this these um these three parts of indirect transaction where there's no economic sense whether intermediates or or how do you prevent um movements to circumvention hubs um and as well where the comp the corporate structures are really uh, really complex and you can't understand who actually is the owner of the goods so <laughs> this is where it becomes very tricky and companies need to be very, very careful that if these three things don't check out, then there is a good reason for you not to engage with this business. The final example I want to show to you, and we're coming to an end because I'm aware that I've been speaking for a long time and what we really want is our debate, is our questions, um, which we won't record. Um is about the due diligence and the export control part. And here, uh, I've not selected EU, not selected the U UK, I selected the US, and I've selected ITAR, because that's really one of the most strictest uh, due diligence requirements and compliance requirements there could possibly be, because this is about military and defense articles of the US. And you know very well, if you've been in export controls, that the US is very, very strict and hot on compliance when it comes to defense articles. So. ITAR has the string, most maybe the most stringent rules when it comes to compliance. So I wanted to start off with that uh, as an example of export control. So then we did AML, sanctions, and export controls. So staying and, and getting in compliance with ITAR uh, means you need to know what the ITAR wants. Now, we cannot discuss the export control regulations for military defense in detail at this in this um, in this training here, in this chat. Uh, for this, we have separate ITAR and export control and US export control training. Uh, but overall, um, there are three things that you need to do if you if you were to want to export um, goods out of uh, out of the US that are military components that have military applications. Registration, fine. Maintenance of records, that's already getting bordering the due diligence part, and then obtaining licenses before you're making these exports. And um, that all requires you to have a robust due diligence system in place. So we need a compliance program uh, with the ITAR. And here are kind of the three elements that they want you to think about. Um, so first of all, they say, well, you might be a defense company or not. Even if you deal with defense article or data related to it, there is a risk of possible violation of ITAR rules. And so therefore you need to be very vigilant, even though you are only managing data of someone, that you can actually comply with these requirements. So these companies, even not aerospace, defense, et cetera, companies, military companies, still have compliance programs in place, regardless of their direct involvement in the manufacturer, exploit, exporting or brokering. So that's something to think about. The other thing to, of course, to think about when it comes to U.S. export controls, they apply everywhere in the world. So having a U.S. component going from Singapore to India means that ITAR rules need to be considered and applied, in fact. So that means you also need to understand um, your business operations to identify potential risks. So here we are again, the same message as before, risk assessment. And then only can you design a data compliance program based on your needs. And that's what you then need to do. Uh, establish a ITAR and export con uh, compliance program as advised by the, by the US. And then this is what they say. A effective program typically includes documentation in a written form, customization to fit the specific needs of the business, 
regular review and updates, and strong support from management throughout. And these are the 10 uh, expected due diligence things that the ITAR would like you to, to consider. Now, we're not going to go through all of this, but what this is very specific for US export controls. But if you just extract something from these 10 things, you will see due diligence written all over it from a goods perspective, from a flow perspective, and from a person perspective. And that means unless you are diligent and unless you can evidence that you have it under control, then there is really no possibility for you to carry out exports of military items from the US or anywhere in the world involving US content. So if we summarize all of this up, what does that mean? Well, it means, in my opinion, the following. There is basic due diligence and there is enhanced due diligence. For basic due diligence, here are the kind of things that I would reasonably expect you to do. For de facto, any transaction that is international, um, I would want you to think about at, to what extent all of these need to be carried out. There should be an answer to all of them. Whether you need to conduct physical visits or not, that's up to you and your particular circumstance. But you should know that that could be a basic requirement and you should have an answer to what you say, why you do or why you not do this. If you want the whole package and if we work together to design your due diligence system, then that's the kind of basis that we start off on. You know, I'm going to say, all right, these things, how do these, how, how can they work? And then we work out which priority should be given to each. And as we design a, um, a due diligence system based on risk assessment, this one is, is one of the things that I am particularly interested in. And then when we realize that for three quarters of your products, basic due diligence is fine, but for one quarter of your products, we need more than basic due diligence, then we have a separate part or a new system of whatever you wish um, that enhances your due diligence strategies. And we offer a practical way to have what we call enhanced due diligence. Now, in the context of sanctions against Russia, that's particular. But overall, if you are asking me what are the general things that we need to consider for enhanced due diligence, I would point you to three things. More thorough background checks, compliance verification, and harnessing open source intelligence. Now, you kind of understand what is more thorough background checks. We gave you lots of plenty of examples of this, and I can elaborate more. Please get in touch. Compliance verification, that's asking your customers to comply, to showcase how they comply with regulation, not just ascertain it. Uh, and so there are lots of things that we can do to help you enhance the checks that you carry out in a meaningful way. But the best, coolest one and really interesting one is harnessing the open source intelligence. And I want to come to an end to this presentation just by focusing on those for a moment. And we can call it OSINT, open source intelligence. And that can enhance significantly your due diligence efforts. And it also can be relatively low cost because you can leverage publicly available data to gather insights that might not be apparent through traditional due diligence. And that means sitting in front of a computer and researching, having clever people to come up with a profile, come up with an idea. And you, you, know, you can use more modern virtual maps uh, to physically verify a presence. You can look at ownership structures insights by researching and, and Googling and, and trying to figure out. Um, there are lots of databases nowadays that you can have access free or low cost to help you with that. There is a legitimacy and reputation check so you can look what others have said about the company, you know, reviews and whatnot. Um, and if there's none, well, that can tell you something. When the company was established, if it was established yesterday, uh, maybe not. Right. And then, of course, is there anything that would suspect that there is a violation with regulations in today's world? You can find a lot on, on the Internet. Um, and if there is a violation that is reported, then you can pick that up quickly. For example, the U.S. Uh, publishes um, extensive analysis of those she has fined. 
and um, and yeah, so you can see that. And then of course, if if the situation changes with that company, then you can also figure figure that out. So. Um, we're coming to an end now because I've been speaking for quite a long time on this topic. Um, there are three top tips that I give my clients and they are, in addition to this strategy that I've outlined where we do a risk assessment, then we do due diligence assessment and so on. Um, there are three other things I want you to, to remember. Recognizing and addressing biases and blind spots using technology and then outsourcing due diligence to third party services. When we all do this, one of the reasons why companies come to me and they they do in-house a lot of work, but then they outsource it and come to, to me um, is because of this. They, they don't, they want to address bias and blind spots that they can't see by working within the company, within their structure. And that means you can now get an outsider, uh, partial, an impartial view from me. <laughs> and also, you know that we have through Customs Manager Info, a really, really powerful tool that allows us to stay up to date with export control sanctions and AML uh, legislation without the bias of, of company. Um, so therefore our updates are not influenced by internal company matters. And that's important because it means that without knowing what the company is all about, the information you get is pure, so to speak, and therefore it can help with addressing blind spots and working with someone on the outside is addressing that and make sure that your strategy is rounded. There are lots of um, there are lots of software tools that you can use as well. I've put some down here. Um, they can be very effective if you know how to use them. So again, companies come to me for them for, for an evaluation, a benchmarking of which software is uh, the most suitable. And I can help you with that because I've worked in global trade management software companies for over five years. So I know what they can do and what they can't do. And therefore, it is quite useful um, to get a second opinion before purchasing something that can be quite expensive. And then finally, of course, um, you need to consider working with an external partner. Um, third party due diligence makes sense, especially when there are third party service, third party th services and due diligence that are on offer that allow to design a company due diligence system uh, for export control, for sanctions, for AML, or for the three together in a joint consulting, uh, joint up approach or focus on specific countries, specific sectors. Um, so that's designing for a company. Running due diligence systems on an ongoing basis is another thing, another offer that we that we bring, bring to our clients, where we on a continuous basis screen new partners, screen old partners. We have our own sanction screening software. We have our own sanctions experts and they can take your transaction run them through the system and give you a report and give you tips and ideas um, and they can even carry out the screening for you so all you need to do is tell us or let their, your customer get in touch with us and then we run them through the system we come to an evaluation if they meet your criteria that we've set together and then they get a stamp of approval from us that means we've checked them for sanctions, export controls, and any money laundering, or the parameters that you have set up. And then obviously um, there is the um, less detailed company-specific support, such as expert knowledge, industry insights, global perspective, and that enhances your internal capabilities. Obviously there is um, bespoke consultancy and advice. Uh, you can book a call with me at any time. There are trainings on export controls and sanctions that run on a public basis so for anyone, but also on a private basis um, in-house. And they are also on demand available. So if you want to watch this after uh, a normal day or, or in between, then that's also available. And don't forget this, the special service that we have is weekly updates that come directly into your inbox. And that includes the legislative review and the changes of notification. 
That is the part on due diligence for this week. I have one more announcement and then we are ready for the Q&A. So if you have any comments on what you've heard right now, and I appreciate there, um, there is a, um, there are there are questions in the chat that we can pick up in a moment as well. So thank you very much for those. Um, just one more announcement. Next week, that will be the 19th of April. We are talking about something completely different, which is going to be duty suspensions. And that's exciting if you've never heard of it, because the duty suspensions for 20 that were decided in 2023 in the UK have come now into force. And they suspend the customs duty on many products. So that is actually really good uh, if you can use them, but not so good if you want to use them, but you can't. So that means you've got to take, got to join. We've got to think about whether that can be useful for you for next year and then put in an application to get your duty rate down to zero officially approved by the UK government. And so you see there is a way that you can save quite a lot of money if you're currently importing into the UK and have a positive rate of duty. We're going to dissect all of that next week. And all you need to do is next week, sign up to um, this event, starts again at 12. There'll be a presentation. There'll be ample opportunity for you to ask questions. And then we'll talk about duty suspensions, which will be really, really cool. And the, of course, you're going to get lots of documents and lots of information as before. With that said, does anybody wish to have uh, uh, ask a question? Then you can now unmute yourself um, before we move into the second part um, and the Q&A. You, you have a chance now. I'll give you about 10 seconds. And in the meantime, while you're thinking about that, uh, whether to ask a question or not, I would like to thank all of my viewers that are joining us online because your the recording is now going to pause and that means we got to say goodbye to you because the next section is going to be held under da, 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 Chatham House rules. And that means that we're going to discuss openly and we can also venture into lots of other topics, suspension, BCOM, um, EU customs reform, what export control, sanctions, whatever we wish, but we won't recall that, right? Because it's our community and we want to, we want to have our space to, to talk. So therefore, uh, if you're watching online uh, and this is a recording you're watching, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe and share this video with as many people as you think should see this. And that helps the channel and that helps us as well to run more of these events. And then check out customsmanager.info because you're going to get a lot of information on this topic and many other topics as well. And if you want to speak to me one to one about your your, your questions, then you can book that call on customsmanager.org, not info. All right, that's it. If you're watching On Demand, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, all the best and see you next week. Maybe live. Why not? All right. Thank you.